Uh, welcome everyone to the session. Hello everyone. So welcome to the second talk in our summer colloquium, co-organized by Harvard and MIT Society of Physics Students. Uh, my name is Quan, and I'm an undergraduate studying physics at MIT. Uh, one of the and I'm also one of the organizers of our colloquium speaker series. So I'm here today with uh, uh, my core moderators, Minchiel, Tom, and Chira, and we are very honored to have Professor Timon Esslinger from ETH Zurich to speak with us today. So uh, a few words on the formatting, uh, on the logistics. Uh, so if you have questions at any time, you can raise your hand in the Zoom participant sidebar and we'll call on you. Uh, or you can also privately send a message to me and I will ask a question for you. Uh, so we will prioritize those who raise their hands in order to make our events feel more uh, conversational as we can. And in the spirit of keeping this more relaxed and personal conversation, we also request that everyone be muted unless they are speaking uh, and also have their video on if you are willing to and if you are able to. So now before starting the talk, I just briefly introduce today's speaker to, uh, to, to, to you all in the Zoom. Uh, so Minchia. Yep. Uh, thanks, Kwon. We, we are extremely excited to have Professor Tillman Esslinger give a talk with us today. Professor Esslinger is a full professor of quantum optics at the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. He received his PhD in physics in 1995 under the supervision of Theodor Hansch, who is a 2005 Nobel Physics Laureate from the University of Munich and the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Garching, Germany. After he was appointed full professor at ETH Zurich in October 2001, he and his group have stimulated an interdisciplinary exchange between the condensed matter and quantum gas communities. Thank you very much, Professor Esslinger, for giving a talk for us today in Chilokyu. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. Maybe just checking, does the acoustics work? Does it work? Okay, very good. So yes, everyone, hello, and please don't hesitate uh, to ask questions. So I will briefly start with a little bit of physics and in particular, oops, uh, okay. I have to move here. Yeah, okay, yeah, it works. Uh, I will, uh, I want to say a few words on quantum simulation and Quantum simulation uh, is a word which is used a lot these days, of course, by different, uh, yeah, on different, concerning different platforms. So I will take my uh, take on it. Okay. And uh, the easiest way is to say what is not quantum simulation. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not, it's fantastic physics, you will see. Um, for example, uh, superconductivity. Superconductivity uh, was observed by Kamerling Ons in 1911. And it's a, it's a, a fantastic phenomenon. Um, and kind of 50 years later or so, uh, people came up with the BCS theory describing uh, superconductivity. However, uh, here one has to be aware that the Hamiltonian describes the phenomenon of uh, superconductivity. It does not describe the system. This is different with quantum simulation. There the idea is that the system that you look at is the Hamiltonian, that basically your Hamiltonian is almost identical uh, with the system. And then starting from creating such a Hamiltonian, like uh, yeah, you build a Lego Hamiltonian in a way in your lab, then you access the many body physics and uh, try to understand it. And why would you want to do it? There's one line of research you want to answer open questions, maybe questions which you cannot answer by uh, simulations, but since you know very precisely what the Hamiltonian is, this is very, can be very meaningful and give new insights. 
you might also create new many body systems. I mean, um, condensed matter physics just gives you a certain range of Hamiltonian. A very interesting question is, of course, uh, what type of many body phenomena does nature in pr principle could it provide? Be because, I mean, we know only part of it. The, the quantum mechanics is much, probably much broader than, than what we know. And also, of course, uh, to see surprises that that's, and then, uh, well, uh, in this case, since one knows the Hamiltonian, there should be a route to solving uh, uh, um, open questions. And if you think about it, uh, with quantum gases, it is not such a bad thing uh, uh, to do uh, quantum simulations because a quantum gas is, well, as the name says, it's a, it's a gas and it's a gas in a container. But if you look at lots of phenomena, I've, well, this is an ongoing list, all these phenomena can basically be, be explained by a quantum gas uh, in a container. So it's a rather broad uh, concept. Since, uh, and, and then uh, the challenge is, of course, to prepare, control, read out uh, of the experimental many body system. Well, it's a chiloquium. So I will not all the time talk tough physics. I will first have a brief look back. And uh, that's. <laughs> Long ago, in a way. So I grew up in southern Germany near Stuttgart. I was born in Göppingen and grew up in Weiping. And I think, reflecting on it, this, of course, in the context of the chiloquium that made me reflect, then I, I, I realized maybe these two uh, towns had an influence. Göppingen, that's uh, a place where uh, a manufacturer of a very famous manufacturer of model railway, railway system is placed. So that influenced me, of course, a lot when I was young. And I built uh, model railways. And basically, looking back at it, my uh, my room as a child, a young teenager, uh, had half of the year, so in the preparation of Christmas and after Christmas, uh, it had more or less an optical table in the middle of it. And that was, of course, the, the, the train set. And here, I, I could not immediately find uh, original old pictures. I, I would have had to dig deeper. So these are kind of icon images uh, from when I prepared a model railway system with my own kids. And uh, so you can see that these systems can be very complex. And one, when one had built such system, one is not afraid of complex experiments anymore. The second influence was uh, in Weibling. Weibling is near Stuttgart. Stuttgart is the home of Mercedes-Benz. And so it's a bit kind of Motown uh, in Germany. <laughs> so it, 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 it's all about uh, cars. And my, my as, as a child, my kind of how I uh, uh, digested that was building uh, uh, model cars, uh, electric model cars. They, they were new there. Uh, they were just about to come out. Uh, radio control model cars, you put kind of biceps, but by building your own, you could even be a bit better. And there was a very smart um, company selling these cars locally or a kind of a, a, a dealer. And he, he always organized also uh, every two weeks a competition, which was real fun. And uh, so I took part and, and uh, tried to improve and compete and so on. So um, that's where I come from. These are, again, icon images from later. I, I, another time, I'll, I'll show you the original next time when I visit my mom. Okay, that's where I uh, came from. The next step uh, uh, was uh, Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. Uh, I, I studied there and uh, what I remember uh, very much uh, from my undergraduate uh, years uh, were the lectures by uh, Herbert Wagner. 
Uh, he, he's um, famous from the uh, mermin hohenberg wagner theorem, so that you don't have long-range order in, in one and two dimensions. And importantly, he gave excellent lectures. They were just fantastic. That's, I mean, from then on, I never totally believed in inverted classrooms and so on, because, uh, I mean, at least if a lecture is really well done, it can be very good. So he, he was extremely good. And also the fun thing was each time I went to the library uh, in Munich, I, I saw him sitting there reading uh, physical review letters. Very comfortably, he was sitting in the library. I, I, I had the impression half the day and I thought, well, this is maybe not such a bad job. So it, <laughs> it, looked, it, it looked at least appealing. Yeah. Um, and another important step uh, that was uh, Edinburgh, uh, in that I spent half a year, kind of uh, two terms uh, during my studies in Edinburgh. Um, very importantly, I'm very happy to have met uh, my wife there. So that was very important. Also, I learned uh, my first steps uh, in the laboratory. And uh, I built my first laser. And that's uh, uh, shown here. It's a Neodymiak laser. On the left, you see, let's see, yeah, here, here you see the level diagram. So you, you pump that with eight, uh, 808 nanometers. Here, here's a diagram of the wa wavelengths where Neodymiak is uh, highly absorbing. And you see, this, this was a design for my laser. It was a little uh, a diode laser and then a little lens. And then, well, there you see that in this blue holder, uh, there's the crystal. That was a neodymium crystal, anti-reflection coated uh, on one side, and then there was a mirror on the other side. So, so all this, uh, that, that was totally new at the time. Um, uh, and, and that led to um, the Mephisto lasers, the, the development. I mean, not my development, but at that time, these papers uh, came out. Uh, and my supervisor there, I mean, I, I went there uh, to Edinburgh and I didn't want just to do courses. I wanted to have a project. And, and that's how I ended up uh, with this very nice project. And a nice uh, a laser, but that was not without uh, uh, some uh, very exciting moments. And you see this crystal there, that was a speciality. My supervisor had got it from Southampton, one, one of these crystals, had a diameter of maybe uh, two millimeters and a length of four millimeters. And you see the holder. Now imagine you unscrew. Can you see my, well, I'll put that, uh, the laser pointer. Here, ah, okay. This, you unscrew those two screws, okay? And then you can lift, uh, lift it, and then you can get your uh, crystal. And I remember I did that. And then it somehow fell off my hands. Or the tweezers, I can't remember what. And you know, now you see the background here. This is an optical cable. And this little crystal was moving here on that. And I was, I mean, I remember it was a long time. At least it felt like a long time. And oops, and fortunately it stopped and did not uh, fall into one of the holes of this optical table. Probably that would have ended my uh, career. Next thing I did, I, I took tape and, <laughs> and made sure that there's no open hole anymore and that, that I had learned from, from this <laughs> situation. But the laser worked well, and I think I did make a good impression there. Uh, 
uh, last year. I, I, I was there and uh, uh, the occasion was that I did get a uh, honorary uh, degree. So I don't know whether, did you hear the background music? Did you hear the music? Oh, I think I, I think I could not hear the music. Um, ah, you could not hear the music. Oh, let's try again. There was I had bagpipes here. <laughs> okay, so that was uh, uh, that was Edinburgh, and um, I did. Oops, sorry, I have to put my volume on the right level. Uh, and with this uh, project, and I had a little um, little project report, I went back to Munich and I asked Ted Hench uh, whether I could join his group um, uh, to do a diploma thesis. Of course, he yeah, lasers, he loves lasers. So he, yes, it was, I think it was an easy, an easy convincing. So, so I could uh, join uh, his group. And uh, so here, here it's again, it's a, it's a picture not from back then. That was a more recent picture uh, when Ted Hench uh, came to ETH Zürich to, to receive an honorary doctorate from ETH Zürich. That was uh, last November. So, uh, so, so I joined his group, but um, there was no concrete project at the very uh, beginning. So the first two uh, months, I played around with diode lasers and and played a little bit, yeah, how you change the wavelengths and so on. But then, in months end of months two, Ted Hench uh, came and saw, well we should build a fluorescence detector. There are these new cameras, CCD cameras with, um, uh, with amplified uh, detectors, and we have some money, we can buy them. And I mean, he's always into gadgets. And well, I thought, yes, why not? That sounds like a good idea. So what I did is then a fluorescence detector from Atomic B. Interestingly, back then, I was quite surprised that uh, that had not uh, that had not been uh, done before at, at the time. For an atomic beam, a fluorescence detector sounds uh, like uh, should have been done, but hadn't been done. So the idea was to have an atomic beam and then um, to have uh, um, a laser beam um, kind of focused down, kind of a sheet of light through which uh, the atomic beam would go through. And then uh, you would have, um, uh, well, uh, sufficiently high NA lens system to image uh, the beam through a, a glass window. And here on the right hand side, that also led to my, my first uh, uh, publication. And then here on the right hand side, you can see there, there is in between another standing wave, two standing waves, um, by which the uh, the atomic beam is refocused, and that le led to this structure that uh, I could see uh, then with my life with the uh, with this uh, CCD camera. So from that, I realized that I do like experimental physics, and um, then I thought, yeah, maybe well, uh, academic careers are tough. Um, my plan was the following, do a really cool project for the PhD, and then maybe, maybe it will work. And so the idea for the cool project was the following, uh, take a, a magneto optical trap, build a slow atomic beam with it, kind of throwing the atoms. And then I wanted to throw them through a, a region, a standing wave region, uh, different light fields, very, very well shielded from magnetic fields, and then having a fluorescence detector to see the atoms uh, from below. He, he, here's the uh, original, um, actually, the, my, my uh, vacuum uh, system. And yes, and the cool PhD I did. 
uh, I could cool, um, laser cool uh, in one dimension uh, to 100 nano Kelvin from two recoil to one third recoil within a millisecond. Uh, nowadays, this, these questions of dark stage cooling are more trendy again, um, but you will see what happened at that time. It was 1996 that it finally published. 1995, I had my results, but published was then 1996. I got my PhD, but laser cooling was dead because uh, there were advances in numerical simulation, so you could always simulate the result as long as you did not have a dense cloud. And uh, there was, of course, Bose-Einstein condensation. So that um, <laughs> uh, was, I had to change my plans. We'll come to my plans in a moment, but uh, let me just remind you uh, what Bose-Einstein condensation is. So in a room, uh, yours, my room, um, the, the, of the gas, uh, the, the particles move around of hundreds of meters per second. And when you cool them down, basically they get slower. Well, at some point you wonder, okay, um, I'll slow them down more and more. And then, okay, they get, uh, there are some uh, uh, uncertainty to, due to Heisenberg. Um, but nevertheless, these particles will still move around uh, randomly, as long as I don't have another scale to, 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 to measure the, the lengths of the wavelengths. Until to, you come to a point where these different um, kind of uh, wave packets start uh, to overlap. When that's happening, then the particles condense or a, a macroscopic fraction of the particle condenses into the ground state. And that's the point, of course, where Bose-Einstein uh, condensation uh, happens. And then you cool further down, then you can get almost complete uh, Bose-Einstein condensation. But at that time, well, this is a paper, um, uh, some of the original manuscript of uh, Einstein, commenting or putting into context Bose's work, uh, where he, uh, Einstein suggested this Bose-Einstein condensation. At that point, it was, it was a very theoretical concept. And even a few weeks before the BEC was demonstrated, I heard talks um, by people who would say either uh, it's impossible to achieve it or only spin polarized hydrogen can achieve it or one, if one achieves it, one cannot detect it. That was just a few weeks before. Um, and of course, most of us, in particular in, in, in Europe, we love our laser cooling. Laser cooling is efficient. You can go down to low temperatures and it has some, some beauty. It's beautiful. It's, it's, some concepts are really, really nice. But in a way, I think looking back, uh, we, overlooked, we overlooked that there is a bigger goal uh, and that is to really cool down uh, and really reach both Einstein condensation and not just write it in the introduction but really wanting it. And uh, that went via uh, evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling sounds a bit like a boring physics because it's like um, just um, you, you, you have particles in a the trap, they collide, the high energy uh, particles re removed, you will stay with colder ones. However, it's very efficient. And I knew when I had the 100 nano Kelvin in my in my uh, PhD in one dimension, Eric Cornell had 200 nano Kelvin in three direct dimensions. And I already got a bit at that time, a bit the feeling, hmm. <laughs> and uh, for them in the 3D, uh, it of course was a question how to measure. And uh, the measurement method that, that I mean, was mostly led by Eric Cornell and, and um, Ketterle and Carl Wyman. I think those were the people back then. And they, they, what they worked out is, okay, just switch off your trap, let the gas expand, and the, the hotter, the faster it will expand, take an 
snapshot with absorption imaging look at it on a, on a camera. And then you see the following picture. So you do cool down, you load it uh, into the trap, and then you see uh, pictures like that. That's a bit later from my, my own uh, results, but uh, you cool it then down. And then, I mean, if you do everything good, well, then you see this. Well, you don't, if there's still some stray light, you see this. But <laughs> if you cool, you see this and uh, further and further, and uh, then you get a, a pure uh, content condensate. And then Eric Cornell demonstrated, uh, well, presented this data at ICOL conference. It was, for me, that was my first international conference. I'd never been to an international conference. First one was ICOL, it was in the island of Capri. It's an island in front of the Italian coast, beautiful. It was really exciting, yeah, it was nice. Of course, Eric Cornell people did not. Out of, I mean, only the cooling people knew him back then. And then uh, uh, two years later, I mean, uh, Wolfgang Ketterle followed suit in, in September, uh, but then uh, his uh, really great experiment was to, to get interference between two condensates and to show the, the wave function character. But, uh, well, that's nice to look at other people's work, but I had to do something uh, myself. So um, I needed another plan. And the plan was to convert uh, the experiment, the, the laser cooling experiment into a PC machine. So that's um, the idea is shown here. Um, so the upper, uh, in the middle part, um, that here, that's what, what was left, uh, what I kept from the previous experiment, with the, which was the, the source for cold atoms. And then uh, here was a pump, and there was a new region uh, uh, for vacuum, and uh, here was titanium sublimator. And here you can see a glass cell that was an inside this box. And uh, I thought, oh, wonderful, I take my source for cold atoms and then I load a second mod in a very high vacuum so I will be faster and so on, everything better than the others. Uh, that's what I, I thought. And then I do a magnetic shield so I have no magnetic fluctuations. And then uh, I build everything, had my coils, my top trap was planned and everything was, yeah, partly built already. And then uh, Eric Cornell came to visit us in Munich and also visited my lab, of course. And uh, <laughs> he looked at it and looked at my, my trap that I had planned. And then he said, you know, hmm, well, I'm sorry to say, um, but actually, is it that the, the oscillating field is, uh, the oscillating field direction is uh, a long gravity? And that, um, and I said, yes, why, why not? Well, then it might not work because there will be a gravitational sag. So you should really have uh, the quadrupole coils um, against gravity, so that the tight confinement is against gravity. So I thought, oh, so I was not so happy about that visit at the first moment, but of course it was very useful. It was really good, the comments. And I thought, uh, no, I shouldn't do that. I need to think. And I did think, and then I realized, okay, one just needs one additional coil uh, to this trap configuration. And that's this, uh, what's called quick coil. It's quadrupole Joffe configuration. And uh, that's why they call it quick. And with this coil, uh, you can create, just with one coil, a Joffe uh, trap in the vicinity here. And, and that, solved, uh, that solved the problem. And um, by the time, when, when uh, after this, <laughs> when, when, with the uh, trap, uh, I knew that uh, I will get another uh, PhD student a few months late, late, later. And then I thought, well, I, I fix this problem before we go in a wrong direction. And, and that uh, 
PhD student there, um, uh, Emmanuel Bloch uh, joined me as a PhD student. And I, I, by that time, of course, I was a postdoc. Um, and uh, we were able uh, to build a, a BC and it fairly fast. We were a bit, not quite as fast as uh, Gerhard Rempe he, in Europe. He beat us about a few months. But anyway, we had a nice machine and uh, we could build an atom laser uh, from it. So that's a fancy picture of the same machine. So what's an atom laser? An atom laser is you have a condensate in a magnetic trap, in a trapped magnetic state, and then you output couple. The first thing we wanted to do is output couple with a Raman transition, but somehow the Raman transition didn't it, it, it didn't, uh, the, the frequency didn't, somehow didn't work. Uh, then uh, we thought, well, let's try RF output coupling, whether our frequencies are correct. And I remember, yeah, it just came in, in to, I think I had to teach and Emmanuel was a whole, whole day trying of like maybe two, three days with a Raman transition didn't work. I came in, then we said, I said, well, let's try now this RF. And then uh, we tried the RF for one millisecond and then a little bit kind of came out, kind of a bit shorter, much shorter than is shown here on the right-hand side, a little bit of a beam. And then we said, well, let's do 10 milliseconds. And then a long beam came out. So it was really kind of this moment, oh, this is really cool. And what we all had overlooked is that there was a gravitational sag which made which actually resulted in, uh, that was the reason that uh, we had a really nice directed beam. Initially, one thought that the atoms would uh, emit, be emitted in all directions, which would have been a bit not so nice. Uh, and uh, for us, for the heavy rubidium, it worked really nicely. And, and these are the results uh, shown there. Um, so, uh, but uh, of course, the uh, we, we also wanted to do, I mean, atom laser was of course nice, but when one has to do the next experiment and we thought, ah, what, what could we do? What, what is the next uh, step? And uh, I mean, uh, Wolfgang Kettle had shown this wave nature, the, the two, the interference pattern. But if you look a bit more closely, then uh, the, Characteristics of the BC is long range phase coherence. So that means, um, well, it's shown here. Um, if you have a thermal gas, there you have some uh, uh, exponential decay of your uh, uh, coherence. In a Bose Einstein condensate, uh, you have also some decay depending on how strong the depletion is. But then if you now move uh, further and further away, there is always a part which uh, will be coherent. And this uh, correlation function, this decay of the correlation function and then plateauing out, that kind of is the uh, property, the long range uh, uh, coherence property of the BC. And before knowing really these in details, uh, I realized, uh, I remember one day I, I left uh, the, uh, the shelling shot when I went the steps down, then I just suddenly thought, oh, we should do two frequency output coupling, and then we have a double slit in the BEC. Because then we our output coupled from two regions and and a super easy experiment experimentally just adding another RF source and then we could output couple two matter waves and sure enough we saw an interference pattern and now we could play with the distance of the slits and we could also uh, change the temperature. And here is a temperature shown, so thermal gas, no coherence, and then partly condensed and fully condensed on the right-hand side. And then we could change the frequency, changing the slit distance, and, um, the, the, and then we could see that the visibility levels off. 
so a nice and and then those people kind of um uh, like Yuri Kagan when he saw that he was super excited because that was kind of what the helium people had, had dreamt of but they of course there's a too, too huge uh, depletion I also put here um, Wilhelm Zwerger's uh, picture because he was at the time when we did these experiments in Munich he was Dean of course he was not such a fan of being Dean he did a good job and but the good thing was it was one floor above uh, the floor where we experimented. Um, and so always kind of four or five o'clock when kind of administrative work should end, uh, he came down and talked to us. And of course, we didn't know so much about condensed matter physics there. And he could tell us everything, answer all the questions. So it was really, it was really fantastic for us. And then uh, it was again time to think what what next. Um, and this is a picture from Varena. There was a Varena summer school. Whenever you have a chance to go to a Varena summer school, it's really nice. I must admit, it's kind of my favorite location for science. <laughs> and and uh, we, we were thinking in Munich, um, maybe building an, a, a second apparatus, but uh, building a second apparatus being the same as the previous one, that, that didn't seem to me to, to make any uh, uh, sense. And at this summer school, I remember that I talked to Eric Cornell. We were a bit thinking about what could the next generation apparatuses look like. And he was saying, ah, they are going to build a quick trap. I was, of course, proud uh, he's going to build a quick trap, but they will add uh, some coils so that they transport and um, and some overlapping coils and then uh, they the quick drive because there you can uh, transform you can um, transform it into well the necessary of it well the basic idea of the quick drive and then uh, uh, I, I realized of course the cuteness of, of the idea that you transport. Um, with magnetic uh, uh, in a quadrupole trap so that you can move from a low vacuum region uh, uh, to a high vacuum region. And interestingly, they, um, for them somehow, I think they had coils of very different size that they used uh, in approach in their first attempts in approach to the, 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 the final trap. And then they, in their final version, they had this quadrupole trap, which was moving. The whole thing was moving. We did another approach. We did an approach of overlapping uh, magnetic coils, as is shown here. That was Marcus Greiner's uh, uh, diploma thesis, a really nice diploma thesis. <laughs> <laughs> was amazing yes he, he built all these overlapping traps and he realized okay you, you the the geometry you need that your quadrupole is actually not changing and that uh i think make it made it possible to 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 make this very reliable uh machine and i also in i recently i found my my first uh, a drawing of the basic concept uh, after this this um varena meeting and here you see also a nice glass cell and some pictures and uh, a picture of a nice result and uh, also that the picture there uh, down there is after 20 years it was dismantled so um in long lifetime, long lifetime. Uh, so there you see how much physics uh, one can do. So let's have a quick look at the superfluid mod insulator transition. So the idea is to put the BEC in a 3D uh, lattice potential and then see what's happening. And then, of course, you get a modulation of the density since now the, the BEC is a band in a band structure. And now you can do time of flight measurements and uh, you see uh, the interference pattern, the different momentum peaks, so basically the, uh, the block states uh, you see. In, well, yeah, the Q equals zero block state is what, what you see. 
And then, um, well, one can also look at it in terms of uh, one-year states. You can look at it that, that you have um, coherent uh, one-year functions uh, over all uh, the different sites. And now what's happening if you increase the intensity? Of course, the modulation gets stronger, but at some point, um, suddenly um, the atom number doesn't fluctuate anymore and you do a phase transition to a mod insulating state. Again, uh, Willi Zwerger was of course a wonderful uh, person to talk to and to understand. And uh, basically what is happening is in, in the superfluid state, the, the ground state uh, is a state where the system uh, tries to delocate to delocalize and by delocalizing and minimize the kinetic energy. But since the atoms uh, have a collisional interaction, an on-site interaction, which is on the same scale as a kinetic energy, at some point, uh, the localization, localized ground state with just one atom per site is a lower energy. And that is exactly the, the mod state. And we could see that uh, in the experiment, so these are data where we increase uh, the intensity of, of the lattice beam. And here you see in the center, uh, uh, that's where the phase transition happens at just above 13 recoil. It's amazingly quantitatively well already this first experiment worked. This also triggered a bit the, 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 the whole quantum simulation. Um, Concerning yeah, the, the main physics, I have uh, well basically explained that um, it, it is the competition between uh, kinetic energy and interaction energy. Another important point is that the superfluid is, of course, gapless, has a gapless excitation spectrum. The mod insulator has an uh, energy gap. And we could also do measurements uh, in this uh, direction. It was actually... Uh, in the experiment was quite funny. We knew that by tilting, uh, well, we need to, uh, when we are on the mod insulating regime, we need to kick the system somehow. We do need to do something uh, to it, but it was very robust. It always, we could always get back our, our superfluid only until we took a strong magnetic gradient and, and tilted it a lot, then we could, could actually excite the system. So, after that experiment, I, I moved to ETH Zürich, where I had an offer for, uh, for the chair of uh, quantum optics. And so I uh, needed to come up with a plan again. So what, what is the best thing to do uh, when starting? And, and this is always a, a challenge. And uh, I had... Uh, when I was kind of applying for different jobs, at some point there was also, I applied for a GSI, Gesellschaft für Schwerionenforschung. They, they produce exotic atomic uh, a nuclear uh, course. So by some kind of accelerator type of um, physics that's near in Darmstadt. And uh, the position I applied for was a kind of, uh, also at GSI and half the in, in, in Frankfurt. And I thought if I don't have anything to do with this um, machine, then they will never give me the job. And then I thought, ah, okay, what could it be? Then I was thinking about rubidium-84, which is an exotic uh, isotope, fermionic. And then I thought, okay, I'll propose to do a BCS uh, a gas, a fermionic gas uh, with uh, rubidium a a 84, because it, it was calculated, John Bone had calculated the scattering length. But um, the offer, uh, uh, of course, from uh, Zürich was much nicer. And at some point in, um, that was, I think, May 2000, uh, May 2001, uh, I had been in a, a, a summer school in Turku. And at that time, that's in Finland. 
very quiet place, was really nice, quiet place. At that time, my, my son was one year old, so I, there was my first one week away on a, and it was quiet and peaceful. And, and uh, I could think. And also at some point, Randy Hewlett mentioned that Debbie Jin is building up in Boulder, I mean, she had pioneered all the uh, fermions, the potassium, but a mixture of uh, rubidium-87 and potassium-40. And then I thought, because I knew I, I don't want to do anything to do with accelerators, but then I realized, oh, that is a nice mixture. All the uh, uh, laser wavelengths, they are very similar, should be easy. And if Debbie Jin does that, then um, probably uh, John Bone will have calculated the scattering length. So it's a good bet on, on, on a good mixture. And then, of course, I, I didn't want to just do a mixture. It would be lame to do the same thing. Uh, but then I read, oh, okay, I'll, I'll put that in a lattice. Then I have fermions in a lattice. I have a uh, I can start off with bosons and then do fermions and can do mixtures and all sorts of things. And then, then I was excited. I knew what to do. That is, um, that is a good plan. And then, of course, we had to set up, you know, <laughs> that's how uh, the lab's uh, renovation, it, it took, of course, uh, a bit more than a year to get air conditioning and so on. Uh, but we could plan everything, and uh, of course the team it was super. Uh, was super happy when Michael Köhl uh, said that he would join as a postdoc, Tito Stöferle as a PhD, Henning Moritz as as a PhD, and then the next generation. So that was uh, really nice, of course. And then, uh, okay, let's build a Fermi Hubbard uh, model, putting in a quantum gas in to an optical lattice. So one could wonder, let me try to be fast. I, I need to get speed up a little bit. Or oh, uh, how, how much time do I have? I have another 10 minutes, 15? Oh, oh yeah, about 10 minutes. And then after that, we will we would like to take some okay. like, 10 minutes. Yeah, so about 10 minutes. Quick. The other things are, uh, yeah, let, let, let's so let, let, let me do uh, here the, the, the physics also, I think the general physics of the Fermi Harbor. Uh, I think it's, quite good to, to reflect and what the, actually the physics is and in, in these quantum gas experiments. In the end, one can describe them by, by many body Hamiltonian with a kinetic energy and uh, a uh, interaction energy and the trap. So the kinetic energy basically that you can manipulate with the band structure uh, by a lattice. And you can also, as you will see, um, also create exotic band structures like uh, with Dirac points and uh, even uh, topological band structures. So that's the T term in the whole thing. And then the interactions, uh, that's of course when the atoms collide and uh, that gives you on-site interaction and the trap one has these harmonic traps, but people have now also uh, built box traps, ring traps, and, and we, we have done quite some experiments with two reservoirs where you have uh, a, a channel, you can do transport experiments. Um, but let's look at the Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian. It's a, it's a simple Hamiltonian. It's uh, 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 very simple, actually. It's simpler than chess. Um, it has two to spin up and spin down. And these particles can hop uh, from side to side. And if they are on the same side, they pay an additional energy U. That's basically it. And this gives uh, you at half filling a phase diagram uh, with a, an antiferromagnet, a normal um, a metal and a mod insulating at half filling, it's well understood. And um, just to give you an impression, what does it mean? A metal, there you have uh, still uh, density fluctuations and you have some empty sites and some doubly occupied sites. In the mod insulating, now um, the, the correspondence to kind of the superfluid mod insulator transition is here the metal to mod. That's not the transition, it's a crossover. 
And uh, if the interactions are strong enough, they suppress the double occupancies. And if you go to a further energy lower, then you will have an arrangement uh, which is antiferromagnetic, where the atoms, if because they can still be localized a little bit um, to order in um, in this checkerboard pattern, is is more favorable uh, for them. And of course, the, the, the interesting question is when you dope it, then on the one hand, you get, uh, for example, um, uh, the high TC question still not, not, not solved. You can also think of question where you dimerize uh, the system also still something to be done. So a lot to be done. So we are getting to, to all the things that need to be done. Um, and well, that was, uh, well, that's my, uh, an experimentalist's picture of a, of a Hubbard model. So that the Hubbard model is really here uh, in the center. And that's where the, 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 the trap um, with the lattice is. And uh, the question is to measure, how to measure. And the first sets of measurements were that we did a band mapping. So you have, the, you, one has to do a bit different there because uh, fermions are different. You don't have the long range uh, coherence. So you have, uh, you load the atoms, you can load them all in the lowest band. And then you gradually switch off the lattice and then you go from the band structure to the structure of the free atoms, but your quasi momentum remains conserved. And that's why uh, you map uh, onto the, the, the quasi-momentum on free momentum states. And then you see uh, here on the right-hand side, uh, that's what a, uh, the gas that comes out if it's the lowest and the, the next upper band is filled. It's a bit funny to think that a gas expands in such a structure, but it does if it comes from a lattice. And second measurement was uh, to measure double occupancies because they are sensitive when you know the average occupation it's sensitive to um, uh, density fluctuations and it distinguishes mod insulator uh, from a metal and we could do that by doing a kind of a spectroscopic transfer between doubly or not doubly occupied sites and doing a stern galar imaging and this way we could show that if we are in the mod insulating regime, the double occupancy is suppressed. That's the right curve, whilst uh, the metal is with uh, is the, the black curve. And that that way we could demonstrate uh, that we have uh, mod insulator. The next challenge uh, is, and that's still an ongoing challenge, is quantum magnetism. And uh, there, the, it's a temperature challenge that is the challenge. So we, we had the, the, the metal you can have if you are above the uh, on-site interaction. You, if you go below, then you have a mod insulator. And the next energy scale is the exchange energy. And typically, and then you get spin ordering. Um, but typically current, so it's a bit older slide, some, in, in some experiments, the temperatures are now below the exchange energy. But at that time, it was typically above. And uh, for us, it was a question what to do, because we wanted to see uh, magnetic correlations. And the idea was, um, to, since the system, you can change things, but your total entropy remains the same you just redistribute. And then we thought, okay, let's make some bonds stronger and some bonds weaker. And then for the strong bonds, we are below the exchange energy. For the weak, uh, weak bonds, uh, we are above. And so we created anisotropic lattices and we could see uh, magnetic correlations. Short range, but uh, we could see uh, magnetic correlations. And uh, that got had some impact. And you can see, well, it was 2013, the, the Huffington Post. And here, the, under the most popular articles on number three, uh, was weird quantum effects observed for the first time. And there were 
there was a media storm. Many people, thousand people were commenting really funny. Um, and my conclusion, and we had a press release, but the press release was, was just very normal and a serious press release. I think it was Thomas Uhlinger who made this picture. And uh, his way to do singlets and triplets uh, states that inspired also people who may not know about singlets and triplets and they liked it. I, I think that it was just this picture that people got uh, excited. Here also, yes, I uh, show you one of the super nice images by Markus Greiner's group of the long range anti ferromagnet uh, with a quantum gas microscope. Uh, fantastic work. Also, of course, Emmanuel did fantastic work with a quantum gas microscope. Um, a question is other models. And uh, we built a second generation of optical lattices, and that was by, uh, done by overlaying two types of lat lattice structures. So you can see uh, on the right hand side these two lattice structures, and by changing the laser frequency and, of course, the relative intensities, we were able uh, to create checkerboard dimer, 1D chains, triangular lattices and honeycomb lattices. And, and that actually just by changing an, an intensity. In particular, the honeycomb uh, lattice, uh, there we did some uh, further work. It was actually pointed out by Dario Poletti and Corinna Colla. They pointed out, well, that this brick lattice, well, this has a brick structure. This brick lattice has Dirac points and has the same physics as Dirac. Um, as, as graphene. And then we thought, okay, let's let's not just only do quantum magnetism, let's also have some fun. And uh, then we thought, let's um, look at the Dirac points. But probing Dirac points is not so easy. Um, they, they have a vanishing of the density of states and you try to probe an infinitely small gap Infinite, and that means infinite measurement times and no signal. That's so. What we did is we took the gas and did Bloch oscillations. We sent the whole gas through the uh, trap and then observed how, when they pass the, the cloud passed through the Dirac point, then atoms were transferred in the higher band. And then by band mapping, we could see that. That's uh, how, how we observed that. And I will now speed up a bit. We can could get phase diagrams and, well, we got nice uh, titles. That was, of course, nice. And now we, um, if you open up this, uh, Dirac point by breaking uh, inversion symmetry. Uh, of course, you have a berry phase around uh, this uh, singularity. And if you have a normal uh, system, what is happening in, in, in for if you break inversion symmetry of two open gaps, do the same experiment, then you will have a whole drift to the right on one Dirac point and a whole drift to the left on the other Dirac point. So difficult to measure. The much more fun situation would be if you had um, uh, the Barry curvature would have the same sign on both. And then you have a drift on both Dirac points to the right. You get kind of a whole drift. It's like a whole current. And that, of course, uh, that idea goes back to a whole day. He realized if I take a honeycomb lattice and break time reversal symmetry, then I open gaps and they have uh, uh, the bo both the same Barry curvature. And so you don't need a magnetic field to get a, a whole conductance, uh, but uh, you just need to break time reversal symmetry. And the way um, we did that uh, is, well, I'm now speeding up here a little bit. Um, to do that, well, he said, 
while the particular model presented here is unlikely to be directly physical realizable, so we are very happy that he wrote that in the paper, makes a nice challenge. <laughs> um, a, a proposal came from, from Hideo Aoki, uh, and uh, that's by uh, Floki Engineering. And they are... Um, uh, you can break this time reversal symmetry and we could, I'm now fast, we could see the transverse drifts, we are shown here, we could measure uh, the point uh, where the uh, where I've just one direct point closes, so this phase diagram, and we were optimistic uh, about interactions, but interactions with flow K engineering is tough. And interaction in topology is a theoretical and experimental challenge. Yet, very recently, we have uh, developed a third generation of optical lattice. And that's now we move one lattice with respect to the other. And then we get topological pumping. And I'm, I will not tell details now about topological pumping, but I'll just share my excitement. Uh, of our uh, a realization where we can get really long distance topological pumping about hundreds of sites without heating. And we can measure, for example, how topological pumping breaks down if we have too strong interactions. We can also see that if we pump in the trap, now we can pump so far that it can see the trap walls. Uh, then we see that it's reflected on the trap walls and pump back. And we can do that with interactions and one can see that there's an additional topological boundary due to interactions. That's the middle and the right hand. So um, we are super happy to, to look at these things at the moment. It's very exciting time. And that's the lab. That's the team of uh, the present team of the lattices. Um, I would like to thank all the, the different members over the time in the different group here. On the upper left, you see that there was the Munich team and uh, that is our present uh, team at ETH Zürich. And I would like to thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Aslinger, for the beautiful talk. And we would like to open up the uh, question and answer session uh, between the speaker and the participants. So please raise your hand if you have any question or please send us any question via chat if you have any question. So uh, while people are thinking about the question, I actually have a like one question to ask you. So um, like at the end of the part of your talk, you, you briefly discussed about this like third generation model that your lab is currently uh, developing. So I wonder, like yeah. I recently read about these 2022 papers in PRL and in Nature about the like this topological pumping like a related idea. So I just wonder whether both of them like are affiliated in the yes. third model that you mentioned. Yes. I see, I see, I see. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there, there is are these. Uh, Two works uh, that was also on, on the slide um, in, in Munich and and also uh, in Takahashi's uh, group, and they did uh, demonstrate the first kind of three, four, five uh, topological pumping sites, but then uh, cycles, but then they didn't do uh, uh, much more on it, and also not with changing interaction. And I think the reason is that they used. Uh, two different laser frequencies. The most natural is to take 532 nanometer and 1064. However, the refractive index of this uh, uh, change changes differently with temperature, humidity, and everything. So it's extremely difficult to build a topological pump that way. In our, by overlapping, in the right way and actually one could have had this thought earlier it, we stumbled across that in another experiment actually this is much it's much more robust because everything is at the same wavelengths well uh, 100 megahertz apart but uh, for robustness it, that makes it robust that that's a big difference but it's it suddenly makes it possible to play with it i see i see i see i see 
I see. Thank you so much for the clarification. That's amazing. You're, you're very welcome. Very, very good question. Ah, thank you so much. So uh, I think there are not much questions from the audience. So maybe as the like last question of for our tradition, we would like to ask you for the some like words of wisdom for us like young physicists about the you know what we should like consider to become a like next generation physicist in the future. Yes, the, 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 the thing now I would immediately now um, say, don't listen too much to me. <laughs> so the, the most important thing is, of course, to find uh, your, your own way and uh, to do your own thinking on the developments. And there, there are certain developments going on, and one, and there are uh, often, in my my perception, there are passions, and it's easy, of course, because one is so busy to follow a passion. But I think if one is able and tries to find the their own spin, a bit away from the fashion if one is totally away then it might be a hard uh, time um, to uh, convince other people that it's exciting because one cannot expect that other people will just say ah this is exciting what you have done you you have to tell of course other people what, to share your excitement in in some form but it's important to think that the goals of today might not be uh, the goals of tomorrow. So one, one needs to reflect, and I would encourage to, to, to think about it. Yeah. That's... Oh, thank you so much for the wonderful words of wisdom. And Chirac, thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you so much. That was, that was very useful advice and like very insightful. Um, Thank you, and like this was a great talk. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, like we are we are slightly over time right now, so um, we would be um we would be ending now. Um, for those um who just joined us for the first time, uh, you could sign up on the Chiloke mailing list uh through the link which Minchil sent in the chat. Um, we send weekly email about like the upcoming Chilokium talks and like uh and send a reminder on the day of the event. Uh, so if you want to stay up to date, please join the list. Um, and again, thank you so much, Professor Slinger, for like the wonderful talk today. Like, um, it was really insightful, um, really exciting. And like, um, for everyone else, we'll see you next week uh, on uh, Professor Hyun Maldesino's talk at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And thank you so much for um, organizing this series. I think it's it's really, yeah, it's interesting. It was very interesting for me to, to prepare and to look back. In a way, I enjoyed it. It, it yeah. And uh, uh, I, I wish you all um, all the best in your careers and 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 the way you will move through. I mean, I can tell you one more story that also maybe uh, you know when we were doing our PhDs, um, we I, I say that was for example Matthias Weidemüller, Wahid Sandogar, also Vladan, and so on. We all thought, oh, this looks really bad for us. There is just one position to be opened in the next five years. And we thought that is a professorship in Hamburg. And we knew it's all of us will probably apply for that. And then many others from the other groups. And we are at each DPG talk and we had a beer together and, and was were telling each other how bad the situation is for us. But it turned out that it, the, a bit more optimism uh, would have been good uh, uh, for us. And yeah, I, I think in the end, usually there are more opportunities that one thinks. And, and I hope that it stays like that. And in our field, it's uh, a lot of uh, new things are happening. I mean, in, in the field, you know, if I think there are two possibilities. Either new things happen or you have applications. If it starts to turn around and it's the same and the same, um, then one has to be careful. Either one has a real deep question or maybe 
one should move on. But again, one has to reflect oneself and come to the conclusion and think about it. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. That was like really like- Okay, so yes. And uh, remember at some point, maybe you want to apply for a postdoc PhD position. You're all welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, have a good day.